Okay, so um, what I want to do today is review a little bit of um, the games that we looked at yesterday, and then I want to introduce the idea of a theory. Uh, there's some basic uh, questions that game theory tries to ask, and um, I want you to know these questions. Uh, and then we're going to start to look at how game theory comes up with predictions for how people, at least intelligent, rational people, would behave in situations of a strategic interaction using a really cool little graph called a game tree. Okay, so we're going to spend some time developing the idea of a game tree, and out of that we'll then work on this concept of a strategy, which is quite a, a simple word, but a very key concept uh, throughout the course. Now, um, on the handout, I've given you the um, results of what we had yesterday, okay? So you don't have to copy these things down again. Actually, <clears throat> wait a second, just before I get stuck into this, let me take a, let me take a step back. <clears throat> I don't know where the Janice Joplin voice is coming from, but who knows. Okay, so uh, yesterday, someone came down and asked me about the textbook. They said, do we need to buy the textbook? Well, I don't really care whether you buy it or not. I think if you can get an inexpensive coffee, uh, second hand coffee for between 30 and 50 bucks, I would buy it. Okay? Because it's essential that you read about 10 chapters of the text of the course. We don't have any lecture notes. We have a really good textbook. Okay? Um, I mean, it's up to you whether you, you buy a new one, which could be kind of expensive, whether you try and buy a second hand one, whether you use uh, resources in the library, you know, uh, copy some chapters, whatever you want to do. I, I do want you to read that material. So um, uh, the course is based around the text. I don't think you'll learn much, and I don't think you'll pass exams if you don't actually do some reading. Again, so you just take that as, that's kind of uh, uh, an attitude you should have towards the text in this course. Then you've got to decide, do I want to buy it? Do I want to share it with somebody else or share a purchase with someone else? That's really up to you, but please do read the text. Okay. Now, the, the second thing is on the, on, this handout, on the first handout, I gave you a list of uh, web links, which I want you to go and play around with. So in particular, the, uh, the course website is on a page that looks like this. There's a bunch of items on the left-hand menu here, and you can go through the various weeks coming along to pick up what's necessary. So like for, for yesterday, uh, we had a handout. Okay, so you click on that, it takes you up to what the, what the handout is that I gave out. After class today, I'll go back and put up the material we had for the handout for today. Okay? Um, it turns out that if you click on the video on the server, you get directed to this page, and here's the first lecture uh, from yesterday that was recorded by audiovisual. Okay, hi uh, guys, on the back there. And if you go over to this link, it'll take you over to UCTV, where I've put up uh, a number of little resources that are related to yesterday's lecture. There is the actual lecture, but this material here, Okay, you're not going to be able to hear it because I haven't got my sound sort of plugged in. Uh, this material here is just the screen capture of, of the slides, totally. And this particular one is raw. I haven't edited it. What I will try to do is each day, it takes me about an hour to process this uh, into a flash file. I'll just get it up there. And then somewhere in the next 24, 48 hours, I can go back and edit stuff. But at least you'll have something immediately after class. And of course, you've got the UCTV ones as well. Okay? So, this one here is just will walk you through everything we did yesterday. Okay. Now, it turns out that um, there is a lot of material from previous years that's actually quite interesting and quite useful to think about. Okay, like you're sitting in the class, you're, we do a little, play a few games. Well, we've done this for a few years now, and, and students actually have some interesting things to say. I realize you don't want to sit there and go through a whole hour of, some, of another lecture. So what I've tried to do is, is cut out maybe five, ten-minute bits of the interesting things that have come out in previous years. And again, if you want to get your head around uh, some ideas and learn how to think a little bit on your feet, I'd go back and listen to those. Also, I'm going to try and design some homework questions that are based on going back and trying to look at what people are doing in previous years and seeing if you can figure out why they did what they did. Okay. 
so there's two items here. One uh, from last year, a five-minute clip which just analyzes the results like we're going to do in the first part of this class. And the second one is, uh, uh, I thought this was from, well, okay, there's from 2005, and then there's one from 2006, which are actual live recordings of what happened in class. But there are also ones where I've added in some material which helps explain what's going on with the student ideas here. Okay? So, I, again, I encourage you to go back and look at these, at these resources. Now, over here on Blackboard, uh, which you can get to, uh, how do we do it here? I, well, don't worry about it. From the main website, there's a link to Blackboard. And so this is what I see. You know, I'm an instructor, so I get to design stuff. But the student view looks like this. And you'll see a little box here called Questions in Class. Okay. And I've I put up two questions already, which I'd like you to go in and start answering. Now, again, these kind of questions are, I would like to put on the first midterm and on the final test. Okay. So, for example, uh, the first one is really to get you kind of interacting, and it's what's game theory all about. Okay. Uh, you um, uh, see, so there's three messages here. Uh, Nicholas Stafford came in, uh, Nan, Nan came in, made some, uh, a couple of comments. What I did is I just commented on um, uh, Nicholas, made an observation on it, and I suggested that she work out some ideas about, from her definition, about uh, interactivity, conflict, cooperation, things like that. Okay, so in this, um, in this discussion session, what I'd like you to do is register and go in. Now, Nicola and Nan, because they've gone in in this first thing, we'll start to accumulate some points okay, just from being there, making, registering that they're there, they're looking at stuff, having an idea. They get an interesting idea, they get two points. And if they, or if you like, you can think of it A, B, C. Uh, and if they have an interesting idea that interacts with somebody else's interesting idea, that's definitely worth three points or an A. At the end of the course, I will go through and aggregate all those, give you a mark out of five points over and above whatever else you've got. Okay? So if you get 99% in the final exam, you will get 104% for the whole course. That's not going to affect your letter grade because you only get letter grades, right? A's, B's, C's, stuff like that. But again, I'd encourage you, it's, it, it's, it's kind of nice you know, when you're failing <laughs> or you just, you know, you just miss that C-. minus. You know, to, oh, well, th there is a cutoff point. It's 45, right? You get below 45 numerically, you're failing, okay? Over 45, you get a C minus. Uh, but if you want to cross that boundary and you're a little bit undecided yet about how much effort you're going to put in or how much, what success you're going to have, then just come in regularly to the discussions of WebCT. That'll help you in that get at five points, but it'll also help you prepare for the exam. I'm gonna every week I'll give a homework question, uh, ask you to do it. We're not really gonna discuss it in class, but we can discuss it online. Okay, so please have a look at those resources that are there. Okay, so let's go back to today's class. Now, yesterday we were playing for some chocolate bars, and uh, we had this stop go game. Which uh, just to refresh your memory, we'll have one. Nice little play again. Um, so, what was your name? Uria. Uria. How do you spell that? A R I A. A R I A. Okay. Um, Aria, do you remember the stop go game yesterday? You know, like uh, round one. If I'm the A player and I say go, it goes over to you. You can say stop. Okay. So I'm going to be the A player, and you're going to be the B player. So again, the rest of you are sort of thinking, what's Fountain doing here with Aria? Well, we're playing a, a game of strategic interaction. Uh, what are we playing for? We're playing for some chocolate bars. There's some definite rules of the game, a structure to the game. And, and it's kind of, this, this game, though, it seems really simple, like that Sebastian made the point, I don't know what to do, it just seems so simple. Well, it, it is simple, but what we're going to do is we're going to learn lots of little simple things that we can put together to make and understand more complex things. And this, this kind of game and ones like it are basically... Uh, if people cooperate, there's some really nice outcomes out there. Things, the pie will grow, okay? And if they don't cooperate, somebody will get something, but it's not going to be very much. So that's the kind of general idea behind this game. It's a simple one. So um, remember, each player gets a choice of either to go or to stop, okay? And the idea of game theory was that we want you to try to predict what player A, who is me, is going to do, and what 
area is going to do. Okay? Now, not only are we trying to predict what they're going to do, but we're kind of going to predict what they would do in situation, in any situation they get themselves into the game. So remember, yesterday we had, uh, um, was it first name? Martin? Martin. Sorry, I can turn around and read too, okay? <laughs> um, so Martin goes stop in the first round, okay? And nothing else happens. There's, there's no further play of the game, okay? That's something that happened in the game. But then if you look at, I mean, there's different outcomes that occurred, and I'll show you some from previous years. Um, but if you look at the very last game, where there were two guys here who I don't remember where they were, but I went outside the room, and they talked with one another, and they got five, okay, because they, we actually didn't really play the game out. All we had to do was read off the strategies, what they were going to do, right? But the first player would go, go, and the second player would go, go, and the first player would go, go, and the second player goes, go, and last guy can go, go, or stop. It doesn't matter, it's just the end of the game. And that's the behavior that we try to predict, okay? Uh, and we got that result partly because they could communicate with one another, okay? So th the idea here... Um, with this stop-go game is that uh, that we've got is you can't communicate. Now, you're sitting there trying to predict what we're going to do. Never think, okay? What's Fountain going to do? Well, what I would do is write things down, but supposing I do it this way, I'd say, well, it's my move first, and I'm going to say go. Okay, what are you going to do? Stop. <laughs> okay, so if I go go... She goes, go, and I go, stop. Then I would collect three chocolate bars. So because I'm a nice guy, I'll give those to you. Okay. Whoops. There you go. Oh. I'll get them later. Or some, yeah, just throwing them around. Okay. So th this game is, a, is, is what's called a sequential game. We're going to look at different kinds of games in a, in a short while. But the idea of the sequential game is um, I do something. I, don't, I can't see what Aria is going to do, but she can see what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, okay? And then uh, I said go, and so she said go, and down at the next point in the game, I could see what she did, and that's why it's called sequential. There's like, I can, there's a sequence to it, a time sequence, and in particular, each player can observe at some points what the other player is going to do. Now, the game we played yesterday wasn't really, didn't look like it was sequential, did it? You know, what was happening is Martin's writing down his strategies, James is writing down his strategies, and they're, you know, Martin can't see what James is going to do, and James can't see what Martin's going to do, and that's called a simultaneous game. But it's really a simultaneous game, it's really all the sequential game, because if we went and played it out, then, you know, Martin would go first, and James would respond, and blah, blah, blah. Okay? So, um, this is the stop-go game. Now, let's go back and I want just to kind of go over these, these, uh, these results. That the first point comes with Martin playing against James. Okay? Now, when we asked Martin about his strategies, he just said he, he stopped and he didn't really put anything in what he would do at round three or round five. He's the A player. Okay? Now, fair enough. You know, you're sitting there... You're trying to think, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to stop. And, and you know that's, he knows that's going to bring the end of the game. He doesn't have to worry about what anybody else says. He's just going to grab that one. Okay? That's fine uh, at one level, but not from a game theory standpoint because we want to think about this a little bit deeper. We want to say, well, it's not just what you're going to do, but why are you going to do what you're going to do? Okay? And so what we might get Martin to think about is, well, What's James going to do? Okay. And if James does go and go, then I should do such and such. If James does go and stop, I should do such and such. If James does stop and go, I should... You know, it's like the idea is, what would I do depending on what James does? Okay. And that's the idea, a part of the idea of a strategy. Okay. A strategy is a complete specification of what you'll do in all the circumstances you find yourself in a game. Memorize that, because it'll be a definition-type question on the exam. But it's an important concept. Say, so a, a strategy isn't just kind of observing. It's sort of uh, what a person will actually do. It's what they would do if certain other things happen, which may never happen. In this game, he says, stop. The rest of the game doesn't go on. Okay? So w this is really an incomplete strategy. 
It's a, it's a decision of Martin's. The game ends, but it doesn't specify uh, what a strategy is. Now, when we went to Sebastian, Sebastian, are you here? Can't see him in the back. Okay. So Sebastian uh, said he was a bit confused, and Haas said the same thing. It's just feeling, hey, what's going on here? I, I don't. Uh, I don't really understand this game, and I, I didn't really write anything down. Okay. Now, in a way, that's part of the game, right? The, I, we, can a person opt out of this game? It's sort of like, okay, I don't understand what's going on. It's very hard for me when I don't understand to be a rational, intelligent player. Therefore, I'd rather not play okay, until I learn a little bit more. And so a lot of game theory is uh, until, about intelligent players is – they realize that they're lacking in something, so they don't want to play. And if they've got that option, they may well do that. So there's a learning thing in games as well. And also your predictions in a, in a game theory, like um, if, if people don't understand what's going on, you might predict, well, they, they would do anything, or uh, they're, not, they're going to opt out of the game, as I'm sure Sebastian at the time would have liked to or, or, or has. Okay? Um, if we go to uh, Alicia and... Uh, was it Helen that was helping you out? Yeah, okay. Um, they were trying to figure out what to do, okay? And so they didn't really write down a strategy, a specific strategy. It's, it was like a, well, it depends, you know. If the other guy uh, does something, then I would do this. And if the other guy was, did this, then I would do that. And that's kind of what we were talking to talk with Martin with respect to a strategy, that kind of conditional sort of reasoning. You're thinking, okay, I... I I want to think about what the other player is going to do, but I don't really know what they're going to do. Okay, That's fine. You don't know what they're going to do. Um, but that's where the game theory is going to help us try to figure out. If we look at Alicia and Haas, it's Alicia sort of thinking, what will Haas do? Okay, And then Haas is trying to think, if he isn't confused, what will Alicia do? Okay, And then... Alicia will be thinking, oh, I know what Hass is going to do. He's going to be thinking what I'm going to do. Okay? So she has to figure out what is he not only going to do, but what is he going to think about what I'm going to do? Is he as confused as I am? You know, are we just going to go around in that kind of circle? Now, what I'd like to do is pull out this uh, example of Karen and Bindi to give you an idea of that circular reasoning. Now, if you, if you listen to the... Uh, Princess Bride segment again, the Battle of the Wits, you know, you get this kind of funny interaction where the Sicilian is sitting there guessing, oh, what, if Wesley can do this and Wesley can do that and he lives in Australia and he doesn't trust him and, you know, he's kind of just this convoluted reasoning process. Well, that's part of the interactivity of game theory. It's like, how do you figure out what the other person is going to do? So let's have a look at um, uh, just Karen and Bindi and their So, and, and this, is, this pattern is shown up in, in uh, many of the games. Uh, for example, I think it's in the 2006 game, which I suggest uh, that you go and have a look at. Uh, two of the players come up with this pattern. Player B sort of reasoned, well, I, I, I did predict that player A was going to stop all the way through, and so it didn't matter what I wrote down. Okay? Because the game's going to stop, I could write down go and stop, go and go, stop and stop. It doesn't matter because I'm, I'm not going to get anything out of this. And that is, that's true. There's an important idea here is that player B, she was thinking about what player A was doing. So let's put that link there. Okay. So the, all the link is doing is saying, you know, I'm player B. I, I've decided that, in this case it's Bindi, I've decided to do a go and a stop. And I'm thinking about what the other player is doing and I expect them to go stop, 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 which is actually what they did. Okay? But my beliefs about what they're going to do are different or could be different than what they actually do. Okay? So that's, that's one level of, of this, this kind of thinking. But we can also look at it from the perspective of player A. Okay? And if you looked at it from perspective of player A, you could say player A is thinking about what Bindi's going to do. Okay? So this is what this red arrow is. It's sort of saying, well, I'm player A. I've decided stop, 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 and I'm thinking about what Binti's going to do. Okay, so that's what this arrow is. But if I could accurately predict what Binti do, what player B is going to do, that is, if I could accurately predict that she would go, she would do go and stop as a B player, 
if that's what I expect and that's what I believe, should I do stop, stop, stop? What do you think? Good idea? Okay. And if, that's right. And if you had got four, you could have shared them with both then good. Or if it is, you're thinking from player B's perspective, right? Okay. What about just thinking from player A? Supposing this game, you're player A, and you're the red player, and you're thinking about what player B is going to do. And let's say the player B was Bindi, and supposing you were kind of clairvoyant that, okay, I know that she is, or I believe, anyhow, that she is going to play go and stop. Okay, so that this is your kind of belief about your B, but you've chosen to go stop, stop, stop. Okay, and would you reconsider your decision to go stop, 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 given what you believe Bindi is going to do? No, no. Uh, not really, because I think if I thought I B was going to do that, that she'd be taking a risk to go on her first turn. So. Oh, exactly. Okay, it, it, she's taking. Um, uh, she's taking a risk to go in her first turn, but that's what you expect her to do. Okay. Just supposing, you know, if, but you want to ask why would I ever expect yeah, her to do that? I'd, I'd have to think. Did I think she was smart or cautious or risky or? Yeah, you could. I don't think so. Good. Um, this is part A, and we believe that part B was going to go, go and stop. Then I would change part A to go. To go then stop, stop, because it would be in their best interest, because they can then um, get a bigger reward. Okay, what was your name? Jeremy. Jeremy and <laughs> Becky? Okay, so Jeremy and Becky are, are they're trying to think through from player A's standpoint uh, about what player B is going to do and what they're going to do. You see, what all I'm trying to get, look at is like, there's, what we observed was a stop, 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 and a go stop. Okay, so that's what we observed. And then we want to say, well, Let's look at it. What would those players believe about what the outcome of the game is going to be? Okay. Now, you know, uh, as player A, if you go stop, 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 the outcome is going to be stop, irrespective of what the other person is going to do. Okay. But then I want, you to, I want you to ask that question, what else could I do? Well, I could do lots of things. It goes and stops in there, right? And in particular, I can go in the first round. And so you, you want to look at your choice, your stop, 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 in light of the things you could do and also your beliefs about what you think the other person is going to do. Okay, so that's the idea here is if you're as a player A is going to be like a game theorist trying to predict what's going to happen. Player B is going to be a game theorist trying to predict what's going to happen. This is what happened. Would that have been the kind of thing that rational intelligent players would predict? Well, if the blue line is sort of this, this is the choices that player B makes. The blue line is their beliefs about what player A is going to do. Okay, again, I'm going in this way. I've got to make some beliefs about what player A is going to do. And if I believe that player A was going to do what they're going to do, then that's a reasonable choice. Matter of fact, anything is a reasonable choice because I'm not getting any payoff. Okay? Let's do this exactly the same logic from player standpoint of player A. If I'm player A and I'm trying to predict what's going to happen, would I think this is what's going to happen in the game? Well, if I think this is what's going to happen in the game, that is in particular if I think that player B is going to play go and stop, on the basis of them thinking that I'm going to play stop and stop, or stop, stop, stop all the way through, should I play stop, stop, stop all the way through? Question one. Okay, that's, should I do it? And, well, in light of what I believe, at least what I'm assuming that I'm believing, I'm saying, no, that's, if, if I'm interested in more chocolate bars, if I play go, stop, stop, I can get, I can bring it to the second round, they will play go, at least I believe they will play go, and, uh, uh, if I believe they play go, then on the third round, I'm going to play stop, and I'm going to get three chocolate bars rather than one. Becky, does that? Uh, no, it makes perfect sense, but I, I wouldn't be a believing that they would go. I would think that they would know that I would stop on the third one if they did go, so they would have picked stop. Good. Uh, great thinking. This is, this is because now what we're trying to do is we're trying to think... 
I want to think like the Sicilian is thinking against Wesley, okay? You know, uh, which is just what your line of reasoning is. You know, if you did, if if I'm expecting, if I'm doing this and I expect you to do that, because you expect me to do that, should I expect myself to be, or should I do this on the basis of that expectation? Because this is a reasonable thing for you to do if you're interested in chunk bars and for yourself. Okay. Now, uh, Jeremy's thing was as well that in their, it, it was in their own self-interest. Um, Several times I've used if they're interested in chunk bars, okay? And that's kind of an important idea here. It may be that what you're really interested in is getting five chunk bars and <coughs> splitting them equally. That's what your real interest is. And it's not so much I want to maximize my own chunk bars, but I'd actually quite like it if you had some chunk bars and I had some chunk bars, okay? That's, that's fine to have that kind of uh, objective. Uh, or, or payoff. We haven't got those things represented here, but we, but we need to do that in game theory. You have to sort of think about what is it that the other person wants in the game. Okay. Now, let me let me take this uh, uh, one well, one level higher. Is we've got sort of what I call here a key idea. Okay. In a game, uh, as a player, you're going to form a belief about what the other player is going to do. Okay. So that's it. That, that, that's an important concept. And then on the basis of your belief about what the other... You, know, you might be uncertain about what they're going to do, and we want to deal with that uncertainty too, but you have some sort of belief about what they're going to do, including your uncertainty, if you like. Given that belief and all that uncertainty, then you're trying to figure out, oh, okay, what's the best thing for me to do given what I believe the other guy's going to do? Okay? So just that's, that's kind of a, an idea of rationality that we're going to carry through in the course, is that people have beliefs... They have expectations about what others are going to do when they're interacting, you know. And on the basis of their beliefs and their expectations, they're going to make certain responses. Now, what I'd encourage you to do is, um, uh, not necessarily this week, but if, you, if, if the course is capturing your attention, um, I'll, I'll put up next week a, a, a link for um, a, um, Thomas Schelling's Nobel Prize winning acceptance speech. Uh, it was three years ago, and it's really on nuclear deterrence. Okay. And it's on, uh, a, it's sort of a, a game of conflict. Uh, Schelling was a, um, a consultant with Rand Corporation that was uh, advised the U.S. government on military matters, well, for a long period of time, especially in the 50s and 60s. And these guys were the early, what are called operations research people, and Schelling himself really was a pioneer starting off game theory. Almost no diagrams. Just is a is an exquisite expositor. I mean, just to listen to the guy is 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 fantastic, you know. And his whole thing says is this belief that people have that nuclear weapons are inhuman to use is probably the most valuable asset we have, and we don't want to lose that. Because if he starts with the question, what is what's the greatest event that hasn't happened in the last 60 years, and that's that nuclear weapons haven't been used in armed conflict. And he said, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in the early 50s, and anybody, no one would have bet that 60 years later we wouldn't have used nuclear weapons in armed conflict. Okay? And a lot of his, his, his explanation of that is basically belief. Okay? So that's, this belief idea is a key idea in, 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 in strategic interaction. And then the, the, the next thing is, your, is what's best for you. Now, I didn't say best. I said, what's best for you? Okay. And I think all the way through the course, I want you to try to make that distinction is that we're going to talk about preferences and payoffs and, and interests and uh, objectives. And, but basically, everybody is different. At least, you know, if we were all the same little, you know, automatums, little robots, then we could all be cooperative and live a nice, happy life like the ants do, okay? Something like that. But we're not. We're all different. We have different objectives and different preferences. Even in this simple game, it may be that you're not out for the most chocolate bars for yourself. That's fine. What are your what are the preferences in in the in the game? So um, th this is kind of a key idea. Uh, another element of this is if you look at it, each player is looking at it from the perspective of the other player. Okay, which is you know do unto others as they would do unto you, kind sort of thing. Well, it really doesn't have anything to do with kindness here. I mean, it might be that you're a kind person. You want you know, big pies split equally, okay? Uh, it might be you're a completely self-interested person. 
I want five chocolate bars. I want more chocolate bars than myself. I don't really care about your chocolate bars. Okay? We're talking to four and five year olds in the preschools when they do this stuff. Okay? Well, most four and five year olds. Certainly my grandchildren are like that. My children were. Um, okay. Um, where am I? Lost my train of thought. This idea of looking at the game from another player's perspective is part of the strategic reasoning, okay? Um, and so what you're going to try and do is you sort of think, well, what do they believe? What's their best response? And that's a big, that is a, it's a big question. It's a difficult one, too, because in order to figure out what's best for them, it's not necessarily best for you, okay? You might think, well, this is what I would do. That isn't, well, it's... It is a part of game theory. I, I want to figure out what's best for me. But in order to figure out what's best for me, I also need to figure out what's best for you. Which means I need to know something about you. Okay, so I need to know something particularly about what, what it is that you want out of the game. But there's, there's even more when we think about this. Okay, because there's a circularity in this reasoning that comes through with that Princess Bride example. And the B player here not only is forming a belief about what the other player A is going to do, okay, that's what this Solvu arrow is, but at another level, they're actually trying to figure out, come up with a belief or an understanding or an expectation about what the other guy is going to be thinking about what they're going to be thinking, what they're going to do, okay? So it's like, at this level, we've got player B not only trying to figure out what the other player is going to do, but also try and make an expectation or a belief about what the other player is going to be believing about what they're going to do. And then, of course, we have the first player. The A player is also going to be doing a similar thing for player B, thinking about what it is that player B will be expecting them to do, but even more, will be thinking about what player B is thinking about what they're thinking about a is thinking about, okay? And that's the circular reasoning. It is, it, it's a very deep problem, is it? What do people believe, okay? You know, and, and in some sense, it's a simple question, you know, I, I believe this. But in strategic interaction, it's, I believe this about you. But you're a you who has beliefs too, okay? So I'm going to have beliefs about your beliefs, and you've got beliefs about my beliefs, so, my goodness, i got beliefs about your beliefs about my beliefs, you know? And it's just round and round. And, and uh, that's always there. Okay? And we'll see, um, John Nash comes up with an idea of an equilibrium prediction where this circular reasoning kind of all makes sense. Okay? I believe and expect you to do something. You believe and expect me to do something. And we each do what one another expect. Okay? And that's the prediction of a Nash equilibrium. That, that's what we call, we'll call a solution of a game. Okay? Any questions there? So you can get a lot of mileage out of this uh, if you, if you um, go back and listen to some of the earlier clips. Uh, this exact same pattern happened. Uh, it happened several times, several years. And again, sometimes we had more live interaction in the class. You can go back and, and try and get your head around this idea because they're, they're, they're quite sensible ideas about uh, how to behave strategically. I mean, the two things you can take out of this is I've got to figure out what's best for me but I've got to do that on the basis of a belief about what's best for you, which means I need to know something about you because you'll be doing the same thing for me. And that's the intelligent, rational uh, interaction. Now, um, I want to start building up a theory of games. Now, the, the idea of a theory is usually some concepts, some assumptions, some logical reasoning, and then if it's kind of a theory about human behavior or anything else real, you want to make some predictions about what's going to happen in the world, okay? And uh, game theorists basically have lots of different theories, depending on the kind of interactive situations that, we, that, uh, that we're dealing with. So, in Dixit and Skeeth on page 20 and 27, uh, they have a description of six questions which, if you like, define the way that game theorists approach uh, strategic behavior. And they're all basically yes or no questions. They're binary questions. Is the game simultaneous or sequential? Are interests in conflict or cooperation? Is the game played once or repeatedly? 
Uh, is there uncertainty or not uncertainty? This is a little more complicated than that one, but are the rules of the game fixed or manipulable? Are agreements to cooperate enforceable or not? Okay, so it's like there's six binary questions and you can answer them yes, no. Now what I'd like you to do for the first midterm exam, and this question has been on every midterm exam, is read those pages, be able to write two or three sentences to explain what the important ideas are be behind those, those key concepts. Okay, so uh, it's, as the course progresses, you'll get, it'll mean, the questions will mean more to you, okay, and the answers to them. But this general idea is, what does it game theorists look at? Well, for example, um, we talked about simultaneous and sequential games earlier on about 20 minutes ago, okay? And the big difference there is, like in an auction, it's a simultaneous, uh, well, could be, a sealed bid auction would be simultaneous. Okay, and you think, ah, oh, what am I going to do? You know, I got to, I'm going to bid something for this, and the other person's going to bid, but I can't bid. But a, a sequential auction would be, you know, hundred dollars here, two hundred dollars over there. Each person can observe what the other person is, is, uh, has bid. So, the, we have different theories for sequential games and for simultaneous games. For the first four lectures of the course, we're going to do deal with sequential games. Then we're going to turn to simultaneous games, and then we're going to put the two of them together. Okay. So. Uh, the, the next question is, in the games, are the interests of the players in conflict or are there opportunities for cooperation? Now, by interests, we're kind of meaning uh, the preferences of the players involved. Okay, in our simple chocobar game, we could think of preferences as how many chocobars you got. Okay? Um, it actually might be that you want less chocobars. Okay, like for me, I, I have to walk back every day, these things sit in my office, and I'm thinking, I really don't want to eat these chocolate bars. I don't want to put on any more weight, okay? So I'd like zero chocolate bars rather than more. I want less. Actually, I want more, but I want less, you know, when I do those trade-offs. Trade okay, so we, we want to know the interests of the players. Um, if all of the players were interested in getting five chocolate bars, and uh, everyone was the same, they had exactly the same interests, it wouldn't be a real strategic problem, okay? So... What we have to recognize is that people's interests differ. Now, sometimes when they differ, you know, a chocolate bar for me is one less for you. It's conflict, okay? Sometimes when the interests differ, there's possibilities for cooperation. Well, there's five chocolate bars out there. Why can't we do something together and share them? Okay? Instead of me getting one, you're getting none, and the total being one, I could have two and a half, you could have two and a half, and we could have five. Okay? So, in, in each game, we want to ask this question, are there, are there possibilities for conflict or are there possibilities for cooperation? And to answer that, we have to know something about the preferences of the players, and which we will do in the first sets of games that we look at, we'll always assume the players know what the preferences are. Third question, is the game played once or repeatedly? Um, this matters quite a bit because, uh, let's see, the two guys who were playing yesterday when I went out of the room, you know, they could have, uh, they could have called across the, across the room, okay, you play, go, 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 and I'll play, go, go as well. And the guy says, sure, 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 okay. And then he plays stop in the first round, and, or on the second round. I'm sorry, he plays go, stop, and captures all three. And he said, but you said you would do this, okay. Well, they didn't do that because they're friends. <laughs> they know one another. You know, it's kind of hard, you know, to trick your friend and then meet them later on and uh, get sort of punished by them because you've, you've really done something deceptive. And so it turns out that, again, in the first half of the course, we're just going to look at what we call one-shot games, games that aren't repeated. Um, but once you start repeating games, there's a whole kind of different logic because now you want to look to the future consequences of your interaction and take that account in your current action. And it's, so we, it, this is kind of an important uh, element of, of strategic interaction. The fourth one uh, is... A, the big question is, is there uncertainty in the game or certainty? Now, James yesterday, when I was looking at his strategies, he was trying to say, well, uh, he had like, okay, if the other guy does this with a 50-50 chance, and I, will, and I think it's a 50-50 chance he'll do that, then I'm going to do this. And then the, if he does that, and I think there's an 80-20 chance he would do that, it's like you're not sure what's going to happen, and you sort of represent it with probabilities. Well, there are many other kind of, of uh, strategic interactions where, uh, you know, you... You're, um, you know, you go to buy a used car, okay? And the other guy's trying to sell you a used car, and, and 
I don't know if you ever bought a used car, but it is really difficult. Because as a buyer, you totally, you know, you want a good car, you're going to fork out a thousand bucks or something like this, and you could get a piece of junk. You know you could get a piece of junk. The other guy knows you could get a piece of junk too, the seller as well. But they get a little bit more, they don't know everything about the car, but they know more than you know, okay? So those two, those two elements that we want to think about is, um, in, in a game are, is there any uncertainty at all? Okay. Now some of the games we're going to look at, like this little, um, um, the big uncertainty here was what were people's playoffs, okay, payoffs. But if we, if we assume that everybody wants more chocolate bars and less for themselves and doesn't care about the other guy, notice that's a big if, but if we assume that, then we know what their, play, their payoffs are, then we can work out certain things. But if you don't know that, then you're uncertain about what the other player's payoffs are. Moreover, there are other kinds of games, uh, like the buying and selling a used car game, um, or the, the hiring game, your manager, student from Canterbury comes in, wants a job, you know, says they're the best things in sliced bread, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, I've had a lot of moldy sliced bread, you know, in the employees that I buy, I don't know what they, I can't, can I believe what they say, you know, and you're sitting there thinking, well, I am, I'm, a, I'm you know, I'm, I'm really good, I'm a hard worker, I've got lots of initiative, a lot of effort, and um, how do you convince the other person of that when you know these things, but they don't know, okay? And they know that they don't know. And we will look at games of what are called asymmetric information, where there's some signaling or screening uh, to, uh, between various players. Um, the fifth one is, are the rules of the game fixed or manipulable? Th this idea is... Um, kind of important one in any kind of strategic interaction is like it's really easy when you're playing Scrabble or you're playing a card game and uh, to you know what the rules are okay more or less um, with uh, with my grandkids they're 10 and 8 okay and we have I, I played a lot of cards as, as I grew up and so I'm introducing these card games and I, but I have a little book called Hoyle's Rules of Games because both of them are pretty stroppy little kids and they're always trying to get an edge out of things you know by oh well, like, I'll pull out the rule book and we can look at what the rules are okay, of, of the card game. But a lot of games in life aren't like that. There isn't a rule book sitting there. There are kind of rules, but are they, are they really fixed? Or can you manipulate the rules? Like yesterday when, we had the, when I went out of the room, we had the private uh, the, the communication going. And then I was asking, okay, what happened? I was out and the young woman said, um, well, they rigged the game. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if they rigged it. They communicated with one another, and they, uh, which is with, it, within the rules. Okay, to communicate with one another, uh, but they got the maximum. They, they got the maximum payoff. But what you what you like to think is, gee, we got this game where we can't talk to one another. We're only getting one. Why don't we create a new game where we talk to one another? And then will we get five? Okay, I, I noticed I asked that a question. I didn't say we would get five because you want to think, well, well <laughs> will you get five or not? And that comes up to the last question, number six, is that. Um, there's a distinction from the history of game theory in what are called cooperative games versus non-cooperative games. And it's not so much do you get really nice cooperative outcomes uh, as to whether a game is cooperative or not. It's more in the nature of the, of the communication. When you leave here today and you go around 5 o'clock to drive home on Rickard and Road, um, you are playing a game with every other driver who's also going along Rickard and Road to try to get home. Yesterday afternoon, uh, I didn't take a lunch. I went for a bike ride um, out, out behind the airport, and I tried to get across John's Road just by the airport there. It's a nightmare, absolute nightmare, for a, someone on a bike or on foot to try to get through one of those, one of those roundabouts. He's sitting, yeah, actually, I, I, I made a choice to go out and, and came that close to getting run over. And I think I've got to, I've got to find a different way. That kind of strategy... Uh, that kind of strategic interaction isn't very isn't very good. But I can't talk with these people, you know. Stop, you know. They're not going to stop anyhow, you know, even if we could communicate. Um, but so the role of communication is important in facilitating cooperation. But it isn't the be all and end all. What really matters is can the agreements be enforced? If you could communicate and you can make agreements, can you enforce those agreements? Now, a lot of the games of interaction that we play, like for example, you guys. What do you, what, what's the student fees this year? 5000 Jeremy, did you pay 5000 to the university already? Probably. Probably, 5000 well, Becky? Yeah, I'm sorry. Hmm? Yeah, I don't check anymore. It's just right. 
Yeah, they look at the bank loan when it comes in. 5,000 bucks. What do you get? What did you get? Oh, yeah, you haven't got it yet. <laughs> what you've done is, you, you paid 5,000 bucks for something that's going to be delivered over the next year, okay? You go to the gas station, you know, you pour your gas in, then you go pay them. Why don't we do that at university? Be good for you guys, wouldn't it? Well, it might be good for you guys. And it might not, because some people would say, they're not going to pay at the end. You know, I'll deliver my services for a year, and you guys will be off to Japan or Tahiti or England or some other place at like that. Okay? Now, so this idea, can agreements be enforced? Well, it turns out, I mean, we have these little contracts, and you have these contracts, but the contracts, how, many, how often do students litigate against profs and profs litigates against the students for failure to pay fees and deliver. Occasionally, there's disputes about the quality of the delivery of, of someone or the quality of an exam in the sense that somebody tries to cheat on an exam. But 99% of the time, it just rolls on. And that's really, that, that turns out that it's, in, it's all, it would roll on even if the contracts weren't there because people have these reputations. And that comes back to game three. Uh, which is in repeated games, you can kind of often get an enforceable, things are self-enforcing, okay, more or less. Okay, I was going to go on to uh, start a sequential game with it, drawing a game tree, but quite clearly we haven't enough time to, to, uh, to do that. So at the beginning of next class, we'll start uh, this theory of sequential games. You should be reading in chapter two and chapter three. Uh, please go on to... Blackboard to look at any kind of discussions that are that are going on about this. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>